name is Kathleen Vollman, and thank you for joining us for the Proning Safely series, a three-piece puzzle. So the first part of the series is the why, the who, the when, and how to prone. I'm a clinical nurse specialist, an educator, and a consultant, and I've published and lectured on uh, prone positioning um, internationally as uh, well as here in the United States. In terms of my disclosures, I am a subject matter expert for the Hospital Research Education Trust of the American Hospital Association on CAUTI, CLAPSI, and pressure injury, sepsis, and safety culture. I also serve as a consultant and on the Speaker Bureau for Sage Products, as well as Atlas Lift Tech, and I'm a consultant for Baxter Healthcare. So we wanna discuss the physiologic rationale and evidence for the use of prone positioning in patients with ARDS and our patients with COVID-19 that are intubated, um, oftentimes have moderate to severe ARDS by diagnosis and identify evidence-based strategies for determining the who, the when, the how to turn patients into the prone position. First off, a little bit about the physiology. It's important to understand when I'm lying in the supine position, my heart or the cardiac structures create pressure against the lung tissue. About 17% of the lung tissue is influenced by that. And that creates a more positive pleural pressure and causes a collapse of the alveoli. And when I turn into the prone position, the cardiac structures pressure against the lung tissue is only about 4%. Um, generating less um, pressure and therefore the pleural pressure is more negative and alveoli actually open or are recruited. And so that's why um, there is lung protection in the prone position. Um, as we talked about, it can improve the uh, dependent aeration by recruiting alveoli, and that's oftentimes why you end up seeing, um, going from supine to prone, significant increases in oxygenation. It also results in more homogeneous lung aeration, which um, can reduce some of the volume-induced lung injury. Um, we also see a decrease in barrel trauma and atelect trauma, um, and this is uh, by the success of recruiting alveoli. And also by turning a patient prone, you may have a significant increase in postural drainage, and that may reduce um, lung infection. There was a fundamental study that was done. It was published in 2013 in the New England Journal of Medicine, and it was 466 patients with severe ARDS that were randomized to either be in the supine or the prone position. And they remained in that position for 16 hours and they were recruited relatively quickly into the study. Um, so early use of prone positioning uh, showed to be important. But as you can see here from the graphs, uh, the patients in the prone position, their survival was um, 84%, whereas the patients that were um, treated in the supine position, the mortality um, or the survival rate was 67%. And that was day 28. And as you can see, uh, day um, 90 that that benefit uh, was maintained. Now, an interesting statistic that helps us clinicians understand the results of a study like this is something called number needed to treat. And in this study, I have a number needed to treat of six ARDS patients in the prone position to save one life. So that gives you an idea of how powerful the therapy is. So the question who and also when to place the patient in the prone position. Well, from that research study, patients with moderate to severe ARDS with a PF ratio of less than 150 meet the criteria. It should be within the first 12 to 24 hours. We want to make sure they're relatively hemodynamically stable so they can be on vasoactive drips, but you want to make sure they're maintaining a mean arterial pressure of 60 to 65. And if the patient is experiencing ventilator asynchrony and it's unable to be addressed utilizing uh, sedative medication, then you may need to add neuromuscular blockade to that therapy. 
So, who not to place in the prone position? Well, clearly patients with facial or neck trauma or spinal instability, patients that have had a, a recent sternotomy or um, have a large surface burn, uh, patients with massive hemop hemoptysis because you're not gonna be able to manage the airway if they have elevated ICP and if they're at high risk for requiring CPR. So how do we set up the environment in the patient? We wanna ensure the patient and family have education about this um, so that they're aware of the purpose. We wanna gather supplies, um, sheets, positioning aid, aids, and Gail's gonna talk more about that in terms of safe ways uh, for the worker and the patient. Um, for prone positioning, electrodes, because you're gonna to wanna to put them on the back, um, and then a packet of pressure injury prevention dressings, and um, Joyce is gonna detail that out in her series of the best way to prevent pressure injuries. We wanna be able to monitor the patient's condition before and after the turn so that we know the benefit. Um, of, of the positioning. It's recommended to turn the feeding off about one hour before the turn um, if the feeding tube is not post pyloric because you wanna reduce the risk of aspiration during the turn. You wanna align the tubes. I sort of recommend cutting the body in half. Um, not literally. Uh, and everything that is inserted um, on this part goes to the top and everything inserted below goes to the base of the bed. The exception to that rule are chest tubes, um, ECMO tubes, unless they're cannulated um, up in the um, IJ area. We also want to consider that um, we want to empty drains and ostomies, place the dressings over the bony prominence. Um, if they have a um, plastic type of securement for the endotracheal tube. We want to switch that um, to a double tape. If we are managing um, their eyes and taping, do not tape parallel, tape horizontal, um, as well as using lacrolube and ensure that the tongue is inside the mouth as a part of it. So what about the how? Well, there's many different ways to do it, um, but the process is pretty much the same. You can do it in, in a two-sheet method. You can do it in a cocooning of the patient. You have two staff on either side with a respiratory therapist at the head of the bed that their sole responsibility is to hold on to that endotracheal tube until they hear an all clear at the end of the proning procedure. So you tuck the arm underneath. Um, so that when the patient turns, the arm comes immediately out. This is where um, if you're doing the cocoon method, you place pillows at the chest, um, the abdomen, and, and the calf area, and then place the sheet on top and, and roll on both sides in order to effectively achieve that kind of burrito or as it's frequently called, or that sandwiching. Here they're using a, a two sheet method where the second sheet gets tucked under. So as the patient is turned, um, the group on the left hand side is actually pulling the sheet and the group on the right hand side is, is pulling the top sheet over and as the patient turns into the prone position. And then you can remove and discard the extra sheets, straighten the lines and tubes. And as I said, uh, most if they use the cocoon method, uh, do the pillows and um, place them in before the patient's actually turned into the prone position. So what are some positioning, scheduling, and uh, maintenance care that we want to do? Um, what is recommended in the literature? You want to consider um, a 16-hour run. Uh, that's what the research shows. We want uh, frequent oral hygiene and suctioning. Move the head every two hours um, slightly and also reposition the arms in a swimmer's position. You wanna make sure you support the feet in a correct anatomical alignment. And if you are doing hemodynamic monitoring, um, consider uh, doing the leveling at the reference point of the right atrium in the prone position. And some also use reverse Trendelenburg to reduce the edema, the facial edema, and the risk of microaspiration taking place.
So how do we know when to stop? Well, from the research study, it showed stopping prone positioning when the PF ratio remained greater than 150 after four hours laying in the supine position. And that is with 10 of PEEP on less than 60% oxygen. But I will tell you in the literature, other than that single study, it's really not clear. Um, but the overall goal is to make sure that you're seeing improvement in gas exchange in lung mechanics and the overall course of the patient before you stop prone positioning. Now, interesting enough, in the COVID-19 um, pandemic, we are seeing the use of awake cooperative uh, patient prone positioning on non-intubated patients that are hypoxemic, requiring oxygen support, either um, nasal cannula or high frequency or non-invasive. And they're usually not in significant distress, so they're um, non-hypercapnic patients showing low saturations. And we need to consider proning them for two to three hours, um, two to three times a day as the patient is able to tolerate Rate. And there are some places that are seeing um, uh, prevention in intubating. The full uh, prone positioning uh, protocol for intubated patients is published in the AACN Procedure Manual, 7th edition. And so I hope you um, stay tuned for the next piece of the puzzle, which is focused on pressure injury prevention in patients that are prone. Thanks.